Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Stanford GSB's ALP 307, the Public Policy Lab, Financial Challenges Facing U.S. Cities. I am Professor Josh Rao, and today we are thrilled to be hosting three expert panelists to discuss urban infrastructure in the U.S., Dr. Megan Ryerson, Dr. Ed Glazer, and Dr. Zach Liskow. Thank you very much for joining us. We're also grateful to the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Hoover Institution for supporting this webinar, which is entitled City Infrastructure Policies, Lessons from Research. As we know from our class, most infrastructure investment in the U.S. is made at the state and local level. City government leaders play a critical role in building, managing, and maintaining infrastructure, such as roads, highways, bridges, public transportation, water infrastructure, airports, and so on. While we know infrastructure is very important, we also know that in many cities, it's unsatisfactory. To provide some background on our course, ALP 307 is an experiential learning class in which we've partnered with three cities across the country, each a different size in a different region and with different economic and political landscapes. We also have three policy verticals or work streams on which student groups are working to assess the efficacy of city policies, conduct research, and make data-driven, evidence-based policy proposals. The policy verticals are economic development, debt and pensions, and of course, our topic for today, infrastructure. Over the last several weeks, we've met with city managers, economic developers, commissioners of public works, and other public officials to learn about what challenges these cities are facing and what keeps city officials up at night. So now we wanna hear from the subject matter experts. The goal of today's webinar is for us to learn what academic research is telling us about infrastructure in US cities, how much infrastructure investment is needed, how much should cities really be trying to do, how should it be financed, and how can we control the costs? Today's panel should help us to answer these difficult questions. But first, let me do some more detailed introductions of the guests. Uh, Dr. Ed Glazer is a professor and chairman of the Department of Economics at Harvard University. He previously served as director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and the director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. Welcome, Ed. Great to be here. Next, Dr. Zach Liskow is currently serving as the chief economist at the United States Office of Management and Budget in the Executive Office of the President of the United States. He is currently on leave from Yale Law School, where he is a professor. Welcome, Zach. Great to be here. And finally, Dr. Megan Ryerson is currently the chair of transportation for the chair of transportation for UPS Associate Dean for Research at the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design and an associate professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning and Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Megan. So I'm now gonna get the ball rolling with a few questions. Uh, the first question I just wanna uh, pose to each of you is just a general introductory question to uh, tell us about your research, what infrastructure topics you study, and what are some of your main conclusions about the state of urban infrastructure in the US. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ed Glazer to begin. Great, thank you, and it's, it's great to be here. My larger um, research agenda over the last 35 years or so has been on cities in America and throughout the world. And, and infrastructure plays a role in that, although you know, one of the key points of the economics of cities is that in fact, the real cities are not made out of concrete. They're not made out of, out of glass towers. Real cities are, are flesh and blood. Um, and the whole function of infrastructure is to connect people and to enable them to, to work out the magic that is, is sort of urban entrepreneurship, urban cultural innovation, uh, urban political innovation. Um, but infrastructure is important. And when the infrastructure doesn't work, uh, the cities don't function. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a soup on of a project that I've been working over for the next, for the last, three years, which is measuring road roughness everywhere in the United States. So the Department of Transportation has been measuring the roughness of America's highways for the past 40 odd years by sending out a truck at a particular speed on these roads and then measuring the bumpiness of the highway. One of the things that may surprise you, given how you know catastrophic the language of the American Society of Civil Engineers frequently is, is that in fact our highways have actually been getting smoother, not rougher, over the last 40 years. And that in fact, during the days in which the ASCE gave our roads a B minus, uh, our roads were a lot worse than most recently when they gave us a D. So they're clearly getting tougher in their grading system over time. 
But none of this says anything about the roughness of our uh, of our local roads. Now, luckily, in, because of you know friendships at Uber, uh, I actually have access to essentially a month worth of national data on Uber rides. And, and all the Uber rides contain information from the cell phones, and they will give you the, the acceleration, not just in two dimensions, but in three dimensions. And so with this, I get the bumpiness of basically every Uber ride in the U.S. And you can see here, this is joint work with Lindsay Courier and Gabriel Kreiner. Kreiner. The, this is you know what we get for Chicago. The red roads are the bumpier ones. Uh, the blue roads are less bumpy. And you can see this is just showing a ride from Chicago's O'Hare Airport to downtown. You can see it's bumpy where they start off. It's smooth on the highway and it gets bumpy again. Now, there are slight challenges in doing this in the sense that the Department of Transportation gets to tell their drivers, they send them out at night, they tell them to drive at 55 miles an hour or whatever speed they want, the drivers will maintain that speed. Uber doesn't do that. And so we need to essentially filter out the extra roughness that's created by cars that move smoother or move at faster speeds or lower speeds. Luckily, the relationship between vertical acceleration and uh, car speed on the road appears close to linear. So it's actually a relatively easy thing to filter out. And we can then use this to estimate the, the level of road roughness at all sorts of different speeds if we want. Now, there are a couple of facts which shouldn't surprise you, uh, one of which is there is a strong relationship between road roughness uh, and you know, variables like race or income. This shows uh, the you know, road roughness within the New York City metropolitan area, so those, that includes 818 towns. And this shows the difference between those areas that are overwhelmingly white uh, and those areas that are overwhelmingly African-American. And the the index for this is it's a z-score so it's a standard deviation is the difference so that it's about a 0.6 or 0.65 standard deviation difference between predominantly uh, african-american areas and predominantly white areas so that's a fairly large difference in experienced road roughness between white and non-white areas that's about the same gulf that we find in cook county the bulk of this gulf is across town not within town but there really is a huge racial component of the experience of road roughness this is income and road roughness in greater New York. So again, uh, between the richest and the poorest towns, again, about a 0.7 standard deviation gulf. So one of the things that rich, richer people do is they buy themselves uh, towns with nicer roads. And you really see, for example, on the border of Chicago and Evanston, just a huge jump up in the quality of roads on the Evanston side. Um, this is the somewhat smaller relationship between road roughness and race nationally. Um, it's, it's shrunk a little bit, but it's still really pretty big. Um, and one of the things that's nice about this, this break at the Chicago border is that we can then estimate the impact of road roughness on speed. Because as you can see, we can see this is road roughness going to the edge of Chicago. So you want to think of yourself just going over the border to Evanston. The drivers know this typically. And as you can see, they get about two miles per hour faster. And it's a, it's a clean regression discontinuity break on the Evanston side of the border. And so this enables us, with some economic assumptions, to calculate the welfare gains of making our roads smoother. So one thing you can do with this is you can document who has better or worse roads. And that's the first thing that we did in talking about income and race or other, other variations. There's a big correlation between coastal areas and road roughness. Um, it's not that colder areas are worse, but areas that have long periods of time where they're right on the edge of 32 degrees. Those are the areas that actually have some of the worst uh, roads. You can talk about, you know, estimate the impact of road roughness on speed. You can do this both at the county borders or by looking at road repaving events. So this is a road resurfacing event in uh, Chicago, and we can then look at this and then see the impact of, of speeds after the road resur resurfacing event. One of the things that shocked us, though, was that very, this is about a tenth of a standard deviation change on average of road roughness with speed. So this is much less than the chicago Evanston border. So what's going on with that? And I think this is the lowest hanging fruit for infrastructure in the U.S. is this is the relationship between road roughness and your probability of being resurfaced in Chicago over an eight month period. And as you can see, the bottom three deciles, so those are the nicest 30 percent of roads, those ones really are less likely to be repaved. But among the top 70 percent, there is no relationship between road roughness and repaving. And in many cities, they will have a rule which basically says that all, all of the roads in the top in the roughest 70 percent need to be repaved but do they actually get to that not at all they get to some tiny fraction of that do they target within that 70 percent not at all they don't have any targeting they do whatever is convenient for them and so it's a simple almost a stupid agenda but it's one that says 
let's figure out how to just give the city, give it a fixed amount of road repaving, how to do it in a more efficient level that actually targets the areas that are rougher. And the beauty of data from Uber is, in fact, pretty much every town that wanted this could manage to get this out of Uber if they pushed or get this out of some other source. And you can then use this to better target your road repaving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. That was great. And uh, as somebody who lived for five years on the south side of Chicago and then for three years in Evanston, uh, I can say that uh, personal experience, I can verify uh, what you're showing in a, a large sample uh, with really amazing data. Thank you very much for, for, for that presentation. Um, on to uh, Dr. Zach Liskow. Uh, great. Uh, so I, I, for much less time <laughs> than Ed, uh, we're all working in his shadow, um, have been trying to understand uh, what infrastructure costs actually are in the UN and United States and, and what drives them. Uh, and I've been working on a few projects. I'll share my screen. First project here uh, is uh, jointly with uh, Leah Brooks. And what we do is we look at the interstates that were built over time to, to help answer a simple question, like has infrastructure become more expensive to build over time in the US? Uh, we think it's high now, we're not exactly sure. If it is high, has something changed? Uh, we study interstates because they cost a half trillion dollars and they're kind of uniform, relatively uniform over, over time in space. Uh, what we find found was kind of wild and surprising even to us, uh, which is that it costs a huge amount more to build uh, inter uh, interstate highways more recently than uh, in the mid 20th century, uh, costs roughly tripled uh, in real dollars between the 1960s and the 1980s. 1960s, it cost about uh, $8 million to build a mile of highway. 1980s, it cost about 25 million, and then it kept on going up uh, after that. Uh, so what this says to us is, uh, unless we can explain it in some simple way, like something significant happened uh, in the US between the 1960s and the 1980s uh, to help explain this. Now, we do try to do some uh, simple things. So one is, you know, does geography explain this? Do we build in more complicated places over time? And the answer is no, and you control for it. Uh, their, their increase is just as remarkable. Uh, do prices go up over time? And, and the, the answer is no. Uh, if you want to address just poor inflation, hourly wages didn't go up. This shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, like construction workers have not like been the big winners the, the last uh, 60 years. Uh, materials prices haven't gone up a lot. So you can see that. All right. Uh, you're seeing the, the wages, material prices, uh, they're flat. Price has gone up, so prices do not explain uh, what's uh, changed over time here. Uh, and that means something probably significant changed in the United States between 1960s and 1980s to, to drive this. Uh, it is also notable uh, when you put the cost of building interstates in international comparison. Uh, the uh, So we tried to assemble all the data on the highway, new highway construction. I think Ed has actually not seen this one. Uh, under uh, construction over time. Uh, there's actually not tons of data on this, uh, but from what we got, the interstates that were built in the US in the 80s and 90s are more expensive than any interstates we could find ever built anywhere. Uh, we don't have all highways, but so far as we can tell, uh, you know, more expensive than that, you know, that Croatia data point. Uh, and you know, way over the you know Korea data points at even you know even in the seventies. All right, so that's one project. Uh, another project that we're doing is try to understand what's going on. We are surveying experts. We are surveying uh, procurement officials and contractors about what they think drives costs. Now they could be wrong, and they could have all sorts of biases and priors. But but here's what they think. Uh, so when you ask them what causes cost overruns, uh, the most prominent thing, so blue is, is procurement officials and red is contractors, uh, the most common thing they say is change your project scope. So if you plan a project for X, 
and it ends up being Y and much bigger, that ends up uh, substantially increasing costs. Uh, and you know, others say other things, but overwhelmingly that's the thing that uh, most folks say. We also ask uh, about things that are particularly uh, having to do with uh, labor. And uh, we uh, many sites, disadvantaged business programs, and uh, some other things. Uh, very few sites, uh, union uh, construction workers, relatively few sites, local hiring requirements. Among those who do uh, mention disadvantaged business programs, they don't say there's anything inherent in it. They just say there's, they, they say there's a lot of paperwork. Uh, many uh, uh, say that state agencies uh, are, and local planning agencies are considerably understaffed. Recruitment officials say this, as well as contractors. Uh, almost, you know, th that's what that, that big blue bar there says, procurement officials overwhelmingly think they're at least moderately understaffed, but then even the contractors tend to think that uh, the, the agencies are understaffed. Uh, and there's also wide agreement that using uh, contractors, sorry, using consultants, uh, considerably increased costs. Uh, I can talk in a bit about how to put this stuff together, but here's at least the raw data in terms of what folks think about what drives costs. Uh, so I think I've exceeded my three minutes here, so I will pass it back to Josh. Thank you very much, Zach. Fascinating. And you know, before you and uh, and Leah did the did the historical work, I, we really didn't have any idea about exactly how infrastructure costs were uh, evolving over time. And uh, now, from your your newest uh, statistics, we also know that in the U.S. Uh, we have some of the most expensive. Uh, roads, which is uh, uh, interstate roads, which is uh, uh, quite interesting, important new fact for us to grapple with. Um, I'm not going to turn it over to Dr. Megan Ryerson to uh, give us some remarks. Megan. Thank you so much. Uh, and I don't have slides, just me and my airport and aviation system uh, renderings uh, behind me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two areas of my research. Uh, one is in air transportation and one is in urban transportation safety. I want to talk about air transportation first. In air transportation, I am most interested in policies that allow us to, that push us to utilize the existing infrastructure, especially the existing runway infrastructure uh, as efficiently at, uh, as efficiently as uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, when I think about expansion of uh, runways, I think about things like displacement. Uh, I think about things like uh, increased emissions and concern for uh, increased land use and and so on. Um, and you know, I like to ask the question: Are the policies and economics and forces in place such that we're utilizing the infrastructure for one particular airport? And system wide, are we utilizing all of the infrastructure that we had? So let me give you a few examples. Uh, one is the is, is in the area of airport slots for our most congested airports. So if you're flying into a, a JFK or a LaGuardia or a Reagan uh, National in Washington, D.C., airlines need landing reservations uh, in order to schedule a flight and execute a flight at these airports. And most other airports in the U.S., we, we don't have this idea of slots, which has its own other issues. But let's talk about slots for a second. Well, what ends up happening when you have slots is that airlines sometimes will decide that it's actually of more value to hoard the slots and not fly flights on their slots, but hold them. So other airlines can't get a, get their hands on that reservation. So the federal government, FAA has put rules in that called use it or lose it. You have to use your slots 80% of the time or so on. But this is very difficult to account for. There's all sorts of reasons that airlines will hide their slot utilization and so on. And so I spend time engaging with the Port Authority and with other, uh, with other, with other agencies to ask the question, is the capacity that we have actually being utilized? And can we recover some of those slots to increase competition, right? And, and, and to get some more flights uh, in there. Instead of jumping to build more runways, are we actually using the slots that we have? Um, uh, in, in past years, I've done things like look at how 
uh, local city governments and the FAA have considered alternatives to runway expansion. Uh, if you're familiar with the environmental impact statement process, uh, whenever a, a city is looking to expand their airport, they need to go through an alternatives assessment and assess the environmental impact. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about how managing demand, economic forces to manage demand, congestion pricing, other, other sorts of uh, economic measures uh, that we could put into place to manage demand are considered in lieu of a, a runway expansion. Um, and actually, Zach, when you were mentioning how consultants can really increase the price, the EIS process is a, is a great example of, uh, of uh, uh, EIS process is a great example of that. Um, I also heard, uh, Josh, you talk about incentives. Um, I'm very interested in a relatively new phenomenon of the past 10 years of airports being able to provide direct incentives to airlines in order to get them to launch new routes. And, um, this was always possible at the smallest of airports, uh, whether it's government, federal government incentives or local incentives. But now our biggest airports, our Atlantas, Dallas, Miami, are starting to provide direct incentives to airlines to get them to uh, increase their routes and expand their route network. It's really flipped the script on the relationships between airlines and, and airports and created a little bit of a Walmart and cities uh, relationship between airlines and airports where the airlines will shop around and say, what can you do for me? And it's really interesting, a really interesting change. And finally, I, I'm really interested in this idea of airport competition across a mega region. Um, so you can think of the question of how much traffic does the city of you know, Huntsville or Knoxville lose to Atlanta? Because Atlanta's airport just has such a huge draw and competitive fares because there's so many flights. People are willing to take a long drive park their car and uh, uh and 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 take advantage of a lower um take advantage of a lower uh fare in that uh, uh in that way in fact the director of the Northwest Arkansas Airport one time told me she loses hundreds of thousands of passengers every year to DFW which is a pretty far drive but that lure of those low fares right and so when I talk about utilizing the infrastructure we have right it's also taking a look at our catchment and say, are we pulling passengers from hundreds of miles away? And maybe we could put some policies in place to better serve people and kind of make air transportation more accessible. Um, I'm also very interested and in, have spent a lot of time in urban transportation safety. Uh, one of the real questions that drives me is, you know, if, if, if a city wants to put in a safety intervention, a crosswalk or another safety intervention, uh, they often have to show that either 100 people an hour want to cross at a relatively unsafe location, or they have to wait until five people die at that location. So we are actually waiting and counting death before we make an intervention that the in interventions are not rocket science. We, kn we know what to do. We know how to make streets safer. Right, but it's really our policies and our, our 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 policy constraints in place that stop us from making these urban transportation safety uh, urban transportation safety improvements. We also know, you know and I thought the uh, racial disparities in rough roads was really interesting. We also know that there are tremendous disparities in urban uh, transportation safety, and when you really address when you really, excuse me, address safe streets, uh, you're really starting to address some of those racial disparities because neighborhoods, uh, uh, neighborhoods that are predominantly low income, neighborhoods that are predominantly people from underrepresented uh, uh, communities uh, tend to be the ones that have the highest uh, propensity for um, the highest propensity for uh, road collisions and uh, and road deaths. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. I mean, those those uh, remarks I think are are really important for us uh, in in the work that that we're doing. I think uh, when we think about uh, airport infrastructure, we if we look across the cities that we're uh, working with in the policy lab this year, one of them is uh, located really. It, it is actually a major hub. Uh, one of them is a city that has a pretty small airport, but has really really uh, very very uh, ambitious growth uh, plans. 
for the city, but maybe haven't thought about the airport. And the, and the other one, I think, is uh, maybe satisfied with its general size, wants to grow, but has very, very significant economic development goals. And they may uh, not have uh, given sufficient thought to the question of, uh, are there direct enough direct flights from the places that there have to be in order to uh, to to make this place to to to, to go? And and I think your remarks about uh, urban safety uh, I, are also incredibly important for us to be thinking about and to be uh, bringing to our to our partners. So um, I want to start out with just a round a round of uh, uh, as we do some questions, uh, just about some general questions about what cities each of you, uh, if you're willing to to answer this question. Uh, have performed well or have used innovative approaches to solve infrastructure needs. So, uh, you know, there have been, uh, all, all three of you have highlighted uh, many challenges, but are there any cities that we can look to that have used innovative approaches to address these challenges where we might be able to say to some of uh, the partners we're working with, this is something that you might want to check out? I'll let anyone chime in. Maybe Ed looks like well, I was, I was, I think actually Megan may be, may be best on this, but because I'm, I'm going to tend to use non-U.S. examples. Okay. So, um, I think one of the things that's most exciting in, uh, and I'm not, not clear that any of your cities are appropriate for this, but I just, I just want to highlight these. These are things that have, have, you know, have struck me as being particularly important. Um, the innovation of bus rapid transit is one of the great success stories of the last, you know, 20 years in, in transportation. Relatively low cost, considerably more flexibility. And really just a great people moving option. There's an old joke that 40 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to four words, bus good, train bad. And that's because of the tremendous cost advantages involved in uh, buses and even more so their flexibility. And if we think about the need to plan infrastructure for decades, if you put in a fixed rail system, that is stuck. If you, if you put in a, a bus system, that is flexible. Um, and it is a shame how we treat buses as if they're the ugly stepchildren of transportation when they are marvelously flexible uh, and just have tremendous advantages. And in the future, right, there's no reason why we can't have autonomous electric buses that are perfectly clean and green and, uh, and sensible. Um, I will highlight, you know, as economists, you know, we, we should always stress that it is almost impossible to think that you can build your way out of traffic congestion because of the behavioral response. I mean, I'm not sure if, if I believe the fully one-for-one -one crowd out that's identified by Gilles Ranton and Matthew Turner and the fundamental law of highway traffic is correct, um, but they basically say if you build it, they will drive it, and you get basically no reduction in uh, traffic that comes from extra building. Um, but there is, no matter, everyone believes that there's a very significant behavioral response. And that sort of suggests that Singapore, which you know, pioneered congestion pricing in 1975, where you actually charge drivers to go on, uh, you know, on ordinary roads during peak times, they really were right. And we really need to think about pricing our roads and not giving away access to city streets. Of course, we do the opposite. I mean, since 2005, we've been increasingly funding our highways, not with gas taxes, but with general tax revenues. And it's just hard to see how it conceivably makes sense in a world where you have any fears about climate change, where that we want to basically subsidize people to drive. And so I would point to Singapore as my second example of a city that sort of everyone could learn from. Uh, and just a final point on congestion pricing, politically, putting prices on things that were free once is close to impossible, right? That's, a, that's asking a mayor to, to walk into a buzzsaw if you're telling that person to do that. But putting prices on new things, like a new road or a new, a new uh, bridge, that's actually usually pretty doable. And so that really argues for trying to impose congestion pricing from the beginning, not just a new piece of infrastructure, but also on new services, like, for example, autonomous vehicles. Since one of the first effects of autonomous vehicles is to lower the cost of sitting in traffic, right? That's going to induce people to sit in traffic more. And so if we can get in something like congestion pricing on autonomous vehicles from the beginning, I think there's a lot to like about that. Great. Uh, Megan? Yeah, that was great points. I want to uh, respond to one or two of them. And one is just agree with the congestion pricing. Um, I do want to say in a, in a city like Philadelphia, we have to be really careful when we talk about congestion pricing, at, um, uh, the, the biggest, poorest city, um, you know, congestion, I would say congestion pricing with options, right? So we have really nice examples of new uh, express lanes that are priced next to, you know, sort of the free lanes, you know, this idea that you have the option to pay and reduce your travel time, you know, a, a sort of cordon based area congestion charge in a place like Philadelphia, where the transit agency is struggling to provide baseline levels of service with all the cuts in funding, we, we do have to be careful about people getting people getting priced out. 
Um, I wanted to also say with buses, I, I'd love to uh, provide an uh, uh, an example of a place I think is doing it well with intercity transportation of buses. I totally agree that the bus is the technology of the future, of the past and the future. Uh, uh, you know, if uh, 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 it, in uh, Wisconsin, uh, actually the DOT just very recently um, granted uh, Sun Country Airlines some bus routes um, or, or uh, maybe the DOT didn't grant the bus routes, but the DOT has been working with Sun Country and Sun Country has uh, bus routes that they use for intercity transportation to bring passengers into a into a, a small hub and then fly to their ultimate destination, right? We don't need to fly everywhere, right? We can connect on the ground and then we can fly, let the, let the airplanes do what they do best, right? Which is the sort of long haul uh, transportation. And let's think multimodally. And, and I think that it's not a state or a city, but I think that Sun Country Airlines is doing a great, uh, is doing a great job. Um, Austin, the city of Austin is a real, is they're a real pioneer with air service incentives. Um, they saw their growth and they provided some incentives to um, uh, American and British airlines to launch a nonstop flight to London Heathrow. It was full almost instantly. It, it, the incentive went away because the incentive periods are limited and it and and they actually started putting a larger aircraft on that route because there was so much demand, right? They really saw we're growing. We can facilitate this growth by encouraging the airlines to launch some new services. And those things really work together um, uh, beautifully. Um, the Boston area, New England area is an excellent example of airport regional planning where airports in, in this larger region, uh, along with the FAA uh, and some other stakeholders got together and said, Boston said, we don't want to expand anymore. We're on the water. We, we can't expand, right? We are, we are who we are. And if we're going to grow air service, we're going to, we have to work together. And uh, they have really, really solid regional plans, transportation. There's a big economic development piece in terms of how economic development will spread through the region. And that is an excellent example. The sad thing about this example is that it's 2006 and we don't have another one to follow up that is more recent. It is a little standalone. I'd love to see more of that. On the urban transportation side, there's a great recent story of uh, Seattle um, really dismissing the rule book that says that you have to um, uh, have 100 people who want to cross in an unsafe place or five people uh, die before you build a crosswalk. And they applied for an exemption. They built their crosswalk. And then they showed how much more sort of demand to cross that location increased once they had safe infrastructure. And so they're also really sort of flipping the script and, script and saying, we know where we need to build safe infrastructure. Let us do it. And uh, I think they're really someone to watch. Thank you. Great. Um, Zach, I'm going to turn to you with a, with a different question. Um, given the high costs of building infrastructure that you've documented, how can cities actually assess the potential benefits of investment, say, in roads against these costs? And are there any policies that city officials might be able to enact to make that assessment easier? Uh, yeah, so this is a, a hard thing to do, uh, of course. Uh, it would be much easier if we had better data. So I encourage all these cities to agitate uh, for having better data to help make these uh, cost estimates. It can often be difficult to know, to benchmark, to know how much things should, will actually cost. And benefits are similarly difficult. Uh, but I think a, a few lessons come out of uh, at least... Uh, the, the surveys that, that we have done. Uh, number one, uh, it is important to adequately staff. Uh, I think that many agencies uh, feel understaffed and are understaffed. It's something that we hear a lot about here uh, in, in the federal government. And I think the agencies would benefit from uh, having better and expert staffing, perhaps having fewer consultants uh, as well. Uh, second, uh, plan early. Uh, we see a lot of issues arise when things are not planned super well early. There's not enough consultation early. 
and then things need to be changed down the road that uh, often ends up uh, substantially increasing costs in ways that could have been avoidable if planning had been done from the beginning. Uh, and third, uh, try to increase competition. So we see many cases in which there's not enough competition for uh, for bids, and there are a variety of ways to encourage competition. One is to actually solicit competitors and say, look, we know you haven't bid much before, but please do. Well, we want to hear from you. We want you to put in a bid. Uh, and another way to do it would be to have an easier process to uh, to uh, to try to reduce the barriers to entry for uh, for competitors. So those are three possibilities: build up capacity, uh, plan well, uh, and consult at the outset, and third, uh, solicit and encourage competition. Okay, great, great suggestions. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about financing. Some of the officials we've spoken to have said that they are constrained in terms of their ability to raise revenues to fund infrastructure investment. Um, Ed, you made the important point that uh, if we're going to have use fees, it's much easier to politically implement those on new infrastructure because that's not something that people were previously using for free. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about is whether you and the other panelists have any views on uh, how exactly is the best way to involve the private sector in infrastructure investment through public-private partnerships or uh, or other structures, and uh, just generally whether there are types of funding and financing for infrastructure projects that you think have shown promise? It's a great question. I mean, I think the first thing to keep in mind is the private sector is almost invariably involved. There's no, there's not a public and private uh, difference. It's just typically when we call public infrastructure is typically contracted for by the public and then produced by the private private providers. In the case of the uh, the PPPs or public private partnerships, there's a private entity that typically is managing those private private providers. Um, the track record of PPPs is far from perfect. Um, and I think in these types of areas, uh, Deng Xiaoping is very wise. And, uh, you know, as he as he said about thinking about capitalism versus communism, it doesn't matter if a, a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. And I think the same thing is true about public private partnerships and public provision. There are times in which PPPs are a disaster. There's times in which they're great. And we need to be smart about which which times these are likely to be. Um, the um, I'll give a couple of examples from this. So uh, the Eduardo Engel of, of uh, Yale is probably the greatest scholar of public private partnerships. Eduardo studied them first in the Chilean context and then moved on to many other ones. Um, in Chile, which is a relatively well functioning country, PPPs work generally quite well. Uh, in the case of uh, other countries where the governance structures are much weaker, they're a disaster. And they're a disaster because if your government is weak, uh, it means that you are very easily subverted by a private entity, and they will typically figure out a way to basically whatever contract you originally come up. It's very similar to Zach's point about renegotiation. Whenever you negotiate with the PPP up front, there'll be an issue two years further down, in which case they will completely renegotiate it and rob the country blind. Sometimes this involves lots of bribery. Sometimes it doesn't. And so the ability to manage PPPs isn't easy. easy, easy. That being said, the work of Ram Singh on road roughness in India shows huge differences between the publicly provided roads and the privately provided roads in terms of road roughness. And the difference here is all about procurement, that when the, the private entities go to build their roads, they actually know how to get high quality road being built. And they're able to stop the people from giving them really crappy roads. In the case of the public entity, they don't get that. And so they just, just build really bad roads. And it's Eduardo has also emphasized that uh, PPP has the incentive to actually maintain the roads. That's actually only barely true in India because you aren't actually being paid over time by um, uh, by through through a uh, user fee. Uh, it's really just coming from the upfront uh, payment on this. So I think that there are there are some really good things about PPPs having strong incentives to maintain quality, having a better incentive not to get taken by the uh, initial entity that's doing the building. But we need to worry that they're going to figure out some way to to soak up the government as well. In general, on financing, user fees, there's just a lot to like about user fees, not just are they, you know, uh, do they do they lead to a, a sort of efficient thing, which is what Adam Smith 250 years talked about, where, you know, if we if we base our building on the places where users really value that, 
that's really a, a you know tends to avoid white elephant projects. You also have a certain amount of equity on that in the sense that you know the people who fly into JFK Airport are a lot richer than the average of Americans, so there's no reason why we should be subsidizing that. I certainly take Professor Ryerson's point though that there are some things where you know equity is involved the other way, and you know no part of me thinks that I really want to make the poor bus riders of Boston pay for all of the costs of maintaining the bus service, and I think that's I think that's entirely uh, that that point is entirely fair. Um, there are ways of doing, you know, the gas tax has a certain, you know, elegance and simplicity in terms of paying for roads, but it's getting increasingly outmoded. And I have a new paper with Jim Paterba uh, and Caitlin Gorbach on this, which actually notes that in the 1970s, gas taxes were pretty progressive because, in fact, rich people drove Cadillacs and poor people drove Honda Civics and rich people then as now drive longer distances. Flash forward 50 years. Gas taxes, 40 years, the gas tax has become far more regressive because poor people drive F-150s and rich people drive Teslas. And so the switch to you know, electric cars means that we have a big challenge for the gas tax-based model. And whether or not we're going to be able to switch to something like a vehicle miles travel charge or some other means of paying for our roads, we really do need to rethink that, uh, that model. And I do think, again, I'm just going to restress this, that in the era of climate change, the idea that we're just going to use general tax revenues to pay for people to drive all over America, that just seems like a, an almost irresponsible thing for us to do. Great point. Yes, uh, Megan, I want to ask if you have any thoughts on financing. And and also, uh, the other question I wanted to make sure to, to ask you is just, you know, a couple of the cities that we're, that we're speaking with are either experiencing or are hoping for really rapid growth, uh, you know, 15 or 20 percent per year. And, I, and, and so I also want to make sure that I ask you the question of just, you know, what, what is it that we should make sure that we're, 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 we're telling them they need to be considering on the infrastructure side in addition to what you've told us so far today? Absolutely. Um, and I, 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 I won't comment on P3s. I, I thought those, uh, 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 what you said, and then also those references are um, uh, uh, certainly more authoritative on, on P3s. Uh, I, I will mention that uh, airports, in order to uh, generate some funding, will sometimes engage in very long-term leases with airlines for their terminals and gates, or even go so far as to privatize their terminals. Uh, so, for example, if you've ever flown into Kennedy uh, T5, uh, it is JetBlue's terminal. They have a you know, 99-year lease uh, on the entire terminal, and it's beautiful, and they've branded it and all of that. But one of the downsides is that those are their gates. So if you are any other airline and you have a problem at Philadelphia and you have to divert to Kennedy, JetBlue can say you're not allowed to use our gates. And this happens again and again when there's a problem. Actually, when the uh, Asiana uh, crash at SFO happened, um, an airline diverted to a nearby airport in somewhat in the Bay Area, and they didn't have any gates, and none of the airlines would allow them to use their gates. And so they just sat there on the tarmac for hours and hours. And that, to me, is anti-mobility, right? It is... Um, the sort of small privatization of infrastructure into these small little pieces, but it's actually a system that all needs to uh, that all needs to work together. Uh, the privately managed terminals uh, it sort of have a, a similar um, a similar uh, a, a similar impact. Um, in terms of cities that have really ambitious growth potentials, I'll say a few things. Per uh, I'll say a few things. Focusing on um, focusing on airports, I would really encourage them to take a hard look. Uh, number one, at their, again, their competitor airports throughout uh, mega region, and not try to incentivize service, for example, that has really strong, um, uh, or not try to incentivize service that is not going to be able to compete with the service that's offered at, for example, Atlanta, if it's only, you know, two, 250 miles away. And really think about their citizens and the kinds of businesses they're trying to lure in and say, you know, what are the key connections this airport has to have? Is it that we need frequent connections to a few places that are well-priced, or is it that we need a large network that is, you know, one or two flights a day. But as long as we have the network, that's what our um, that's what our citizens and you know what businesses looking at our uh, location would like. Um, so I think sometimes cities, especially smaller cities, will have 
aspirational goals. If you ask almost any airport, you know, who their peer is, they'll say, oh, well, Atlanta is my peer. Atlanta, Atlanta, DFW, these airports are peerless. They are, they are themselves, right? And so I think it's really important for an airport and the city together to say, what are our, what are our authentic goals? You know, who are we and who are our constituents? And, you know, what are the businesses where um, uh, we're trying to lure in? Um, similarly, you know, for a city that is thinking about a city, sim similarly for a city that is thinking about growth, I of course would like them to think about uh, densifying. I think it goes with, you know, Ed's point about just building new roads in an era of climate change, right? How can we densify? But that, that, that requires a lot of urban improvements. How can we make our streets safer? How can we increase public transportation? How can we make our schools better, right? What are the things that we do that encourage more sort of dense living uh, uh, in, a, in a safer environment? Great. Okay. Uh, Zach or Ed, anything to add on those points? Okay. Well, um, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, questions from uh, the class. Louise. I can start. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I'd be curious to hear if y'all have any perspectives on um, water and sewage and stormwater infrastructure, kind of around these like similar questions of, you know, how to finance, how to upgrade really old and aging systems for cities that are trying to grow. If there are any other innovative approaches you've seen or cities that you've seen that have done this really well on the water side. So I do water in Africa. I don't do water in the U.S. and it's it's uh, really different. But I, I think that clean water is, you know, in, it is an old line that it's actually the most important job of city government uh, is actually making sure you provide clean water. Uh, this is an area, of course, where the federal government has been very aggressive with deletting funding. I mean, that's been a big part of the recent infrastructure plan, which maybe uh, uh, Professor Liskow wants to comment something something about. Um, in case you're interested, I, I don't really have a lot to say in, in the U.S. context. In the African context, I would just, just throw out the big issue in Africa is really the last mile problem. And it's the last mile problem and it's maintenance. And I do work in Zambia on this. And uh, the last mile problem is a problem where something like, you know, the, the U.N. or the World Bank will come and build water mains but won't pay for the final connections to people's houses. And, you know, the, the connections are a thousand bucks and per capita GDP is two thousand bucks and four people choose not to connect and they continue to get sick. Um, this is not the first time we've seen this problem. Uh, I was raised on a story of engineering triumphalism about New York City, which sort of says that, you know, New York was filthy at the start of the 19th century, and then the good engineers built the Croton Aqueduct, and the clean waters flowed in, and, and the city got healthy. And there is some truth to that, but New York continued to have cholera outbreaks for 25 years after the Croton Aqueduct because poor people didn't connect to the water system, because New York had its own last mile problem. And it wasn't until you had the Metropolitan Board of Health, which started imposing fines on tenement owners who didn't connect to the water system, that the city became healthier. And it just reminds us that, you know, it's not just enough to sort of build some infrastructure and hope that people are going to connect. You actually need to create some sort of system of either strong subsidies or for people who, who to connect or fines for, for, you know, property owners who don't connect if you're actually going to solve this problem. The maintenance is at least as important, and that's true in the U.S. context as well. Uh, I mean, Lusaka, where I work in Zambia, is a place in which nominally everyone has connection to clean water. As a practical matter, you know, people have clean water only very sporadically. And with, you have a clear impact on individual health when the water goes out. And it also becomes, I'll just end on this point, it's a very gendered phenomenon. Because the people who pay the price of the water, water pipes breaking is the young women in the household who have to march to the water, the water elsewhere and get it from a pump. And you can see their schoolwork going down and you can see their... Uh, their, their house tours going up as a result of this. So I think the issue of water, again, maintenance is, is almost always as important as building it to begin with. And, and that's gotta be true in the US context with water as well. Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll uh, take the opportunity uh, that uh, Ed made for me just to emphasize this as an important uh, uh, goal of this administration, important priority, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which passed last year, uh, had uh, $50 billion uh, for clean water infrastructure, uh, $15 billion of which is specifically for replacing lead pipes. Uh, a big part of this is, you know, th there are both efficiency and equity reasons for this. 
uh, efficiency, you know, anyone will be harmed uh, from, from lead pipes, but in particular, it tends to be poor, disadvantaged communities that are that have the lead pipes, which makes it a particular priority of this administration uh, to fund this. So in terms of local communities today, you know, th th there's money to apply to. I know that the, these grants can often be um, challenging, involving, uh, challenging to apply to, involving complicated, complicated consultants, et cetera. But uh, if I were a community in America today that had lead pipes, uh, I would act now because the money won't be around forever. Okay, great. Other questions? Yes, uh, Colin. Yeah, so I can echo Ryan. Luis. Ryan, sorry. Yeah. Good. Uh, echoing <laughs> Luis, thank you so much for being here. This has been really interesting. Kind of from an economic development perspective, we know that uh, infrastructure and economic development are typically closely linked and that development can often follow if the infrastructure is in a good place. Have you seen any examples of cities strategically use infrastructure development to prompt uh, subsequent economic development, whether that be to launch a research and innovation district or to invest in maybe historically underinvested in communities so that then private businesses are more attracted to, to, to show up or to invest in those communities. Have you seen examples of this in your work? I'd love to briefly talk about airports. Um, I talked about those environmental impact statements about runway expansions. Many of them say, actually say, like, we need to remain a hub so that we can benefit the, you know, the economics of the region um, and that that is the main sort of driver to build is to uh, is to is for economic um, development. And they're they're somewhat not wrong, as you said, not only are they linked. Um, I think about Amazon's RFP for HQ2. One of the sort of core requirements of the city was to have an airport with robust connections, right? So we've sort of gotten to this we've gotten to this point that the infrastructure and sort of the operations on top of the infrastructure are incredibly ex explicitly uh, noted for a major business to uh, bring their headquarters in. So there is, let me just add a little bit. So the airports and growth literature is a real thing. I would say the, the U S effects are somewhat debated. I mean, my own, my own stuff, uh, my own view is it sort of, I think it looks more yes than no that does actually have, have an impact, but it is a debated thing. One of the neatest pieces of literature on this, and I don't know if I can put this in the chat room or not, but I'm going to put a link in the chat room, is the work of Felipe Campante and David Yanagazawa Drott. And what's beautiful about this paper is it doesn't have the, the sort of classic endogeneity problem that like you see airports connected with growth. That's unquestionably true. But the question is, are they there because it was the, they, you built the airport in a sensible place. It was going to grow. So it's hard to, it's hard to figure out, that out. What Kampati and Yana Yan Kazagawa Drott do is they look at global cities that are connected in flights that are less than 12 hours with ones that take more than 12 hours. And this makes a huge difference for airline costs, that, that particular break. And they show a huge increase in the amount of business connection between cities that are under 12 hours relative to over and an impact on long-run economic growth. So air connections are the real deal. Now, I will say a, a on the other side, though, with most things involving infrastructure, particularly local rail projects, but you know, you name it, Right. They are so often sold with, you know, invest in this Detroit people mover and then the city of Detroit will come back. And those are almost invariably hogwash. Right. That, in fact, most of the time economic infrastructure needs to justify it by changing the lives of the people who are actually currently there or likely to be there sometime soon, uh, rather than some wrapped up in some mystique of how this is going to cause the place to come back. So, you know, I would really there may be some way of you know, doing cost benefit analysis. There is a way of doing cost benefit analysis that incorporates the likely impact on population growth um, of this, and you can actually bring that in. But the, sort of the more that uh, infrastructure gets sold with ill-defined stories of, of regional comeback, the more likely you are to get involved in completely wasteful white elephant projects. Uh, I'd say that you know uh, one, one one clear example of economic development resulting from infrastructure. Uh, even without like having strict clear evidence on it, is like the New York City subway. Like you cannot have the New York you cannot have New York City without the subway. The density there would be uh, impossible. Uh, I think though it's important to note, uh, in general, 
a lot of the economic development that's going to arise from transit will depend upon other decisions. This is why it's really important to have uh, transit-oriented development allowed. Uh, there are many places where if you build transit, uh, there's actually not much development allowed around it, which will considerably limit the amount of development allowed. It's worked in New York City because you know, we have uh, skyscrapers, et cetera, uh, around many of those subway stops. Uh, but uh, this is obviously very important for economic development as well as uh, climate goals. And some states are working on it, California's trying to work on it, but I think we have a, a long way to go in terms of uh, in unleashing the full potential of development around uh, transit. Great. Any other questions? Uh, just one quick question. You know, it seems as if one of the overarching uh, themes of the lecture today has been that, you know, by densifying, if I can put it, uh, urban developments, you, of course, get um, some sort of economies of scale with respect to transportation. But the question becomes that some of America's densest cities are also its most expensive to live in. How do you manage this relationship between densifying public transportation and making sure that the cities themselves remain affordable for what we actually move into and use that public transportation? Okay, it's not the transportation options do not is are not fundamentally at the at the fault here. Okay, in fact, in general, transportation by expanding the catchment area of a particular employment center, they, in some sense, make an area functioning more rather than less affordable. And that's the sort of centered piece on this. America does have a huge housing affordability problem. This is a problem which I've been engaged with for more than 20 years at this point in time. There is a solution for it, which is to build more housing. OK, that's the fundamental solution for it. It's not to build less infrastructure. And you can stroll around Stanford anytime you want and think to yourself, how many tens of thousands of housing units could be put in in various in various areas if the region actually wanted to have affordable housing? And that indeed is the solution for it. Any other comments on that question? Not, nothing to add there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that Good. Go ahead. No, exactly, exactly what exactly what uh, what Ed said. That was great. Well, we're we're basically uh, at at our time uh, for this one hour webinar. I wanted to ask one last question, uh, which is just about uh, data collection, which has been referred to. A number of you have re referred to it um, uh, over the over the course of our of our discussion uh, from the very uh, beginning of the of the discussion when um, Ed Glazer was showing us this amazing research he's done on the roughness of roads and you know just being able to collect that data could help cities prioritize uh, and do a much better job of actually targeting the road paving infrastructure investments that they're making for example are there other um, sort of low hanging fruit data collection efforts uh, that, that that any of you might uh, might suggest that we guide some of our cities towards. So I, we are we uh, at the White House are currently engaged in uh, a variety of efforts along these lines, and I think that would be really great to have local partners uh, in this. Uh, I think that there is often a tendency to kind of not think in big data terms and not kind of recognize the the full potential that data could help us with here. And I I would love it. I would love it if these three cities as part of their agenda said, like, here's the data that we would want uh, for, you know, that would help us uh, make better decisions. So I think that might include uh, for cities and states around the country who are building similar projects, how much did those projects actually cost? Uh, how much did elements of those uh, projects actually cost? How much did units? Uh, if you're building a rail station, how much did your elevator cost? Uh, if you're building a rail, how much was it per mile? If you're building a bus rapid transit, how much was it per mile? Cities are often, uh, uh, often do not put this data out. And if they do, it's often not in uniform or easy to access format. I think there's a, I would love it if cities would get together uh, and say, like, we would collectively be much better off if we produce this data, made it available to each other, made it available to the public so we can analyze it, 
understand how much things actually cost, understand uh, and understand you know where we could possibly make improvements. That's a, a terrific set of ideas, and uh, I think we'll be discussing that uh, further. And it would be uh, terrific to be able to collect this kind of granular data, which I think is just going to be essential for having more efficient and more effective infrastructure. So we reached the end of the webinar. I want to thank each of our panelists for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and your findings. We're looking forward to combining what we've learned here, what we're hearing from our city partners to produce data-driven and evidence-based policy proposals for them. Um, and thank you again to Stanford GSB and to the Hoover Institution for support during this webinar. Goodbye, everyone.